Welcome everybody to this IIED hosted event discussing the global goal and adaptation, how to make the Glasswork programme inclusive. I'm Catherine, I'm the coordinator at IIED and I'll be providing technical support during this event, so welcome. So I'd like to now hand over to Emily Beauchamp, who's a senior researcher at IID, and she'll be our moderator today. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, welcome everyone to our webinar today. I'll be your moderator for this webinar. Uh, but much more interestingly, we are glad to have today with us, uh, I'm delighted to have four amazing panelists. Next slide that will uh, allow us to go more in depth about their perspectives and experiences around some of the issues about the GLASS and the GGA. So thank you very much uh, to be here with us today. We're looking forward to a very stimulating and rich discussion. We have today with us uh, Cindy Singh, a climate change advocate from Trinidad and Tobago and uh, for the Small Island Development State. We have Mokoena Francais, the Director uh, at the Lesotho Meteorological Services and Co-Coordinator on Adaptation for the Lee's Developing Country Group. We have Maria del Pilar Bueno Rubial, a Professor at the National Council of Scientific and Technical Research of Argentina and the National University of Rosario and an ex-member of the Adaptation Committee. And we have Funanani Morami, direct, Deputy Director for International Climate Change at the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment in South Africa and a member of the Adaptation Committee. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, but before exploring the views uh, of our panelists on the priorities and processes that can ensure that the GLASS and ultimately the GGA can be most inclusive, uh, we will turn to a brief commentary from the incoming Egypt and the outgoing UK presidencies on this topic. Uh, so please, uh, Mariam Alam, who is the climate adaptation negotiator for the COP27 presidency, and Morgane Chichia, Chichia, sorry, climate adaptation negotiator for the COP26 UK presidency. Mariam and Morgane, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks so much. And yeah, I just want to say thank you to um, IED for organizing this event and, and really for providing this additional space for exchange between parties and non-party stakeholders. I will be very short um, just to say the outcomes on adaptation are central to the Glasgow Climate Pact and the Glasgow Sharm and Sheikh work program on, on the global goal on adaptation is a recognition of the need to deliver on adaptation and to show effective progress. The Glasgow Pact makes it plain that the world needs to do more and to work effectively together. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to um, parties who reiterated in many of their submissions that inclusivity and transparency, among others, were essential to successful work programme, but also to non-party stakeholders who have shared their views and sent submissions as well. Um, I checked this morning and there were seven submissions from admitted NGOs and sometimes as groups and alliances. Um, one from an admitted intergovernmental organization and one from the UN system. So it was a really welcome to help inform the work program. I just want to mention also, I think IED in framing the event, um, you said, um, you, you put on there on the event page that without diverse voices being heard and integrated, the glass will remain an empty exercise. And just to say, we, we very much agree with that, with that statement. And because the main point of today is to listen to everybody else's views, I will stop now and hand it um, back to my dear friend, Maria. Um, thank you so much, Emily, Catherine and uh, Morgan. Uh, you have put it um, very nicely, Morgan, as a start, so you make my task way easier. First of all, on behalf of the COP27 presidency, we are very pleased to be invited to this important event. Uh, myself being a former negotiator as well for the African group, I recognize and the presidency as well recognizes the body of work um, that the civil society organizations have brought um, into the process, especially when it comes to adaptation and the global goal on adaptation. Um, uh, we look forward to building on the success that has been achieved by parties together with all non-state actors um, at um, COP26 through the Glasgow Climate Pact. And as presidency, our COP president designate has included in all of his pronouncements that the participation of youth and civil society is key 
as well as all our decisions on the way to COP27, all our interactions and decisions um, on the way to and at COP27 will be informed by science and need to be transparent and inclusive. Um, and we have indeed heard the priorities of parties, including on adaptation through the HOTS delegations consultations that we have held uh, together with the UK earlier this year. We have also um, heard the priorities of parties as well as uh, the, the non-governmental organizations, most recently um, in the May Ministerial on Climate Action. And um, we, we aim to make progress across the board, balance progress, timely progress uh, across all thematic areas and agenda items. But what has also popped up very prominently is the importance to make um, urgent and timely progress on adaptation. And this is informed and substantiated by the findings of the IPCC Working Group 2 report. So uh, without, without further ado, um, we'll be um, keenly uh, um, keenly listening to all of the uh, interactive discussion that is to come through this event. I would like to thank you on behalf of the presidency for inviting us and for convening these discussions um, through the, such um, platform. And uh, I give the floor back to Catherine to kickstart the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Morgan and Mariam. This is really quite an inspiring thought. Uh, and we hope to have a really catalyzing discussion that will be at the level of your expectation and those of our quite vary audi varied audience that I see today. Uh, for the purpose of also uh, uh, newcomers to the topic of the GGA, I will now give a very brief background on the GGA in the glass and on this topic before we turn to our, our panelists. So as most of you know today, the Paris Agreement established the GGA in 2015. And leading up to the Paris Agreement, developing countries stressed the need to increase focus on adaptation actions towards having parity with mitigation actions and efforts. So this is very much the spirit of the GGA uh, that was established with the aims of enhancing adaptive capacity, building resilience, and reducing vulnerability. Now, the GGA was accompanied by several other provisions for scaling up work on adaptation and sets of tasks that were given to constituted bodies under the UNFCCC in 2015. However, there was no specific guidance for operationalizing the GGA. And while progress has been made over the past six years, it has been slow and work has large, largely been taken, uh, taken place into silos. That doesn't help solve the methodological and political complexities of designing a global goal that can capture the multifaceted and very contextual realities of adaptations across the world. So now during the glass, it's very much time to break these silos and make sure that all actors work together. Six years after the GDA was set up, parties have launched the Glasgow Shamir Sheikh Work Program, or as you've noticed, the glass, to do further work on the GGA. So this is a great opportunity to bring everyone together. And this is the establishment of the glass is really a successful outcome of COP26 and a significant step towards progressing the GGA into concrete actions. But to get concrete actions that will work for the whole of society, there must be engagement from, the whole, from all the actors that are parts of society in the design of this framework and in accompanying processes. So while key modalities and activities have been established for the GLASS by the subsidiary body for scientific and te technological advice and by the subsidiary body for implementation with the support of the secretariat, um, there are still some, some key aspects to, to look into. Uh, we, welcome, we welcome a very useful informal event on May 5th uh, held uh, uh, as part of the GLASS program. And there has also been a launching workshop by the Maldives government last week, but a detailed program of how all the actors will be, uh, will be taken, how the views will be taken account over the next two years, which is actually quite a short time, remains to be decided. So while the SIPSTA and SBI with the help of the Secretariat will jointly carry the program, there's a lot of other actors that are invited, part of the UNFCCC, but also outside the UNFCCC. For example, there are the presidencies, the adaptation committee, the working group of the IPCC, other constituted bodies. And while the work program is very specific that it should reflect the country-driven nature of adaptation and avoid creating additional burdens for parties, it should still be carried out in an inclusive manner 
with the involvement of party, but also on the basis of equitable representations, should also add, have observers, civil society experts and practitioners. That is a lot of people to, to get involved. And this is also the glass must take into account uh, traditional knowledge, knowledge of indigenous people and local knowledge system and be gender responsive because without taking into account human rights across the most marginalized and vulnerable, com vulnerable communities in the world, how can the GGA leverage and enhance adaptation actions that will be fair, equitable and address their needs? Without further ado, it is within this context that today we will turn to our four panelists to kick off the discussion. The format, we will address four overarching questions for which we will allow time for debate, exchange of views towards sharing their perspectives from their countries, regions, but also from their own experience as individuals. And I'd like here to formally flag that the views presented and discussed today by our panelists should not be taken as formal party or group positions, but rather as an exchange of views between people who deeply care about this topic in their careers, but also in their daily lives. We will also have time for questions from the audience uh, at the end. So please, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function. Also use the voting system to help elevate the uh, questions that you think uh, that you are interested in. Now, on this note, we'll be taking down the PowerPoint to focus on our panel list. And let me focus, uh, let me kick off the discussion by asking our panelists first. According to you, what are the priorities of your country and regions under the glass? And how do you think priorities change between actors? I've seen Funanani first, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Emily, and I'm happy to be participating today and I'm happy to be discussing with friends. I think I know everyone who is, there, who is in the panel uh, for the dis discussion today. Um, I think, first of all, just allow me to take a, a step back before responding to say that um, I think in my view, when the GGA was being discussed in, in 2015, um, the idea was really to motivate for a political will um, that will help in uh, to ensure a much needed uh, means of implementation um, for developing countries uh, in implementing their adaptation action. Um, um, and um, then delving in into the question that you have, you have asked, I think um, the vision um, should be that over time as a global community, we should be able to then understand the, the direction of travel for adaptation and also importantly understand um, the kind of um, um, efforts that are required. Um, this is mainly in relation to technical, financial and techn uh, technological um, support in order for developing countries to meet then um, the, the challenges. Uh, and then in terms of the priorities for, for the work program, I think uh, for, for, for South Africa, and I will also speak uh, touching, although not should make a, a disclaimer that I'm not an African group negotiator, coordinator, but I do, I am part of the Africa group, um, is that uh, it, we should at least have an, uh, an understanding and, and, and in understanding of the elements of the global goal on adaptation as contained in Article 7.1 of the Paris Agreement, um, as well as uh, we, it is also the view that this should be informed by um, decisions that have been taken after then parties established the GGA, such as uh, your Katowice decisions and so forth. I think it's also important as a priority that there is an understanding uh, and definition of tools that will then be being required to actually then practically operationalize um, the GGA. This is in terms of um, the guidelines that 
would need to be in place, um, the methodologies that would then be also relevant for each of those elements that parties would then have um, highlighted um, in, in the first priorities that I, that I mentioned. I think also of importance is the complementarities of um, the virus communication and reporting um, tools that are currently there under the UNFCCC that then can assist us in the in the Paris Agreement. I think I'll just stop there and, and hear what my colleagues would say. Thanks, Finani. Cindy, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Catherine and the rest of um, the IIED team for organizing this webinar and for um, inviting me to share views uh, in relation to these questions we have before us. It's also an honor to be among these um, panelists who, you know, have all also worked with in different ways um, at the negotiations over the last few years. To respond to your first um, question, I think against the background of the latest scientific evidence that we have from the AR6, in particular the Working Group 2 report, small island developing states are in a particularly bad position. And this has been said, and now we are seeing the impacts of this manifest. The Working Group 2 report notes that climate change is contributing to humanitarian crises where climate hazards interact with high, um, you know, they interact quite closely and climate and weather extremes are increasingly driving displacement in all regions with small island developing states being disproportionately affected. And they, they are, the Working Group 2 says this with high confidence. So this is something that is very real for uh, small island developing states and those who live on these islands. Um, for FOSID's implementation of adaptation action is therefore critical and remains a priority. Uh, many calls have been made for nationally led adaptation action uh, and for community led adaptation um, to be undertaken, to be enhanced and scaled up, and for action to empower and enable communities to increase their resilience and ability to respond to changes being brought by climate change. And these changes are not somewhere in the future, but rather taking place um, already. Therefore, I would state that enhanced implementation of adaptation action is very important. And as this is one of the objectives of the GLASS, um, the work of the um, GLASS in this regard is um, particularly important and ultimately should result in enhanced implementation of adaptation action. So all of the work that we expect to do under the Glasgow Shamel Sheikh Work Program um, to enhance and have greater understanding of the GGA, um, to discuss and un unpack approaches to assessing progress towards the GGA, all of this is actually premised uh, on actual adaptation action being undertaken in countries and in communities which are already on the front lines. Um, therefore, you know, it is my view that the need to engage in discussions with parties and technical experts is very critical and is a key expectation for the um, Glasgow program uh, in order to not only enhance understanding, but for us to work um, on this, uh, what approaches will be appropriate, how those can be uh, made use um, in the small island developing states in terms of how we assess progress towards the GGA. Uh, so I would think those are some um, priorities for small island developing states uh, for the GLASS uh, and all of this to also help small island developing states to be able to develop robust monitoring, evaluation and learning systems in relation to their adaptation goals and actions being undertaken. Uh, one of the key pillars required for all of this is for SIDS to be able to access and make effective use of support, including financial and grant-based support to undertake adaptation action. And whilst we've had a promise at um, Glasgow for the support to be doubled from 2019 levels to 2025 levels, this will still fall far short of what will be required. So it, it is a good um, place to start, but certainly not enough. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you know, one priority for the GLASS is to be able to catalyze uh, support for adaptation as we unpack all of these issues um, that we've listed in the objectives. Um, to answer your the second part of the question, I would say the priorities do not change substantially in my view among different actors. Um, they may rank different actors may rank these priorities differently or articulate them with different words, but it's um, the importance uh, 
to enhance implementation of adaptation action and the ability to be able to afford to undertake this action remains of paramount importance to small island developing states. Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, Pilon and then Mokwena. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for the invitation, as well as Catherine. And, and um, I'm very happy and, and I feel honored to uh, share the panel with all these uh, amazing speakers. Um, let me share some ideas coming from Latin American region, and of course, also from, from the Caribbean, if, uh, if uh, um, I am allowed, of course, to, to share with Cindy there, uh, but that she may, of course, um, highlight if, if we agree. Um, first of all, I think it's, it's quite important coming from, from the last report of the IPCC Working Group 2 to understand that um, one of the main uh, issues here is that our region uh, has uh, limited information and some uh, lack of data uh, that really need to be um, filled. So uh, we understand these, are, these um, gaps and lack of data is, is quite critical, in particular related to impacts and, and risks on climate change uh, in, in critical sectors such as water, uh, food production, even uh, if we consider that our region is, is uh, an international food producer. So, uh, and, and in the uh, geopolitical context is, is even more important. So that, that need to be understood. So the glass is, is an opportunity and for us is a priority to, to identify better these, these gaps and to make if possible an structured plan and, and a cooperation in the region and of course uh, globally in order to build reliable data that, that really can be monitored um, and, and, and can assist the planning and implementation processes and of course the, the m and and mail processes. Also, as, um, as Cindy said, um, we, we know and, and, and also IPCC and identify that in a very clear way financial support is, is uh, a, the biggest barrier for Latin American and the Caribbean region for implementation of adaptation action. So for us, it's quite important. It's probably um, the, the critical issue here that, that GLASS can be an opportunity to, to promote equitable access to financial resources for adaptation according to the needs and priorities of, of the Global South and, and from my region in particular. And when we talk about this, we are we are referring to, to the quantifiable part of all this discussion. So this is quite related to the new financial goal and these conversations can't be taken in isolation. That's, that's what we have so far. Uh, GST, financial goal, uh, GGA, like conversations in isolation. So these really need to have other kinds of approach during SB uh, 56. Um, also other topics very quickly, because I, I know that, that we need to, to of course, to, to give uh, some time for, for Makana um, to, to say that uh, for us, it's also very, very important to um, have some, some approach that also include regional cooperation during, during the GLASS or during the, the work program. So this is also something important to take into account. Also to, to, to be very clear in terms of sectoral, national, local, transboundary dimensions. This is already clear in the objectives, but we need to implement that. So how that is implemented is quite important. And just very quickly two points that maybe I can take um, uh, later in the discussion to say that I understand that there are, there are um, in some cases, the needs are not so different, but they are, uh, they are amplified at the local level. So we can have the same need for, for planning for implementation or to develop an m and &E system, but the, uh, if adaptation uh, finance, for example, is quite limited, is quite limited for our region, it's, it, it is even more limited for local actors. So it's, it's the same issue, but the approach and the level of the problem is not the same. So that's also need to be understood. My very last is uh, the importance of cost of adaptation. And I will take that um, in, in, uh, in the next round, if it's possible. Thank you. I'm sorry for, for taking too much time. That's very much okay. And uh, I'll thank you, Mokraina, and I'll, I'll welcome other participants to, to um, 
uh, our panelists to respond to each other. Mokraina, please go ahead. Um, thank you, um, Emily, for, 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 for the invitation. I, I was wondering if you, when you're doing your invitations, you looked at the issue of gender balance. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I, I, I am happy to be part of this um, 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 group of discussion and I, I'm, I'm happy to be among these beautiful people who have presented before me. Um, let me go straight to the question that we have asked. Um, the beauty of speaking last is that you just um, align yourself with whatever that has been said. Um, <clears throat> for us, the, the most important thing is to understand the extent of vulnerability and, and therefore the need for adaptation. And that understanding will go back to my fellow colleague who just spoke before me, uh, that uh, to understand the extent of vulnerability, you have to, you need um, um, enough data set so that you can do the, the, the assessment of how vulnerable um, 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 your country is or the, the, the community is. Uh, so that understanding will also lead us to financial needs for adaptation. Uh, for that, whatever you're talking about, whether it's a community or whether it's a country or a region, um, when we have um, a deeper understanding and um, uh, of the vulnerability and ad uh, adaptation needs, uh, then we can also have an idea of how much is required, uh, what kind of technology is needed, and what kind of knowledge is, is required for us to be able to uh, um, um, implement or reduce the vulnerability. <clears throat> so, so, meaning the issue of data, uh, whether it's meteorological data or climate-related data, and um, socioeconomic data is very vital uh, for us to be able to understand uh, what is going on. Um, I also want to uh, touch on the issue of um, um, reporting or measuring progress. Um, it's one of the most important issues uh, that we have to address to be able to measure progress because it is through that process that we can be able to say uh, whether we are moving towards our goal or we are uh, and we are moving with the appropriate speed um, it, it is through that we will be able to say whether we have to uh, pick up or uh, um, uh, uh, because we might reach our goal um, uh, outside the timeline that we have put um, uh, uh, for ourselves. I think um, um, the other thing I, I, I want to say is that um, um, we think priorities differ from actors. Actually, we understand adaptation as uh, it differs from um, region to region, from country to country. Um, it also differs within the country from a community to community, even household to household. So it, it can also differ from individuals. So we, we, we think it, just, uh, it greatly differ from um, 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 actors. Um, allow me to say this is my uh, intervention for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'll, I'll merge a bit the discussion into the, the second, uh, if you want, overarching question about, you know, how to make sure to integrate uh, local and vulnerable voices? Because we we've heard that it's you know it's really important to have to, to you know uh, to hear the very real uh, problems of, of the lack of adaptation for the SIDS and and we've heard how you know uh, local needs and local priorities the, the issues felt at the national or global level are just amplified locally. And you know, as as our last panelist, as Mokwena has just mentioned, um, the views on what is needed can differ between subgroups, and you know, they are they will be maybe similar issues, but priorities may be different between individuals, households, regions, etc. So, very much in that spirit, um, how do we make sure that we integrate local and vulnerable voices? Uh, to make sure that the adaptation with the framework designed by under the GGA integrate the, these voices. So how do you think the glass can do that 
if and I would encourage our panelists to point to quite concrete examples if there are suggestions. And Funi, please go ahead. Funi and Annie. Um, thanks, Emily. Um, actually, I wanted to just um, um, add more uh, based on the, what uh, other colleagues have been saying on the Please first go ahead. question to say that um, um, I think uh, most of the people who are here would recall that prior to Paris, the African group was rallying behind uh, the GGA. Um, as much as we we are, have been hearing that um, the priorities from countries to country, I mean, Mukwena is South Africa's neighbor, for example, he just mentioned that from household to households, the priorities differ. But I think it's also important that as country are then uh, implementing this two-year program should not lose um, the idea mm -hmm. that was there in Paris to make adaptation a global responsibility. Um, um, and I thought maybe I should just, um, I should just highlight that because that is very, I know that's very important for, for example, for my region to maintain adaptation as, as, a, as a global responsibility, hence the need for globally a political will and support, as I mentioned earlier. So I thought I should just, uh, just chip in a bit to just say that, but over to you, thanks. Thank you, Funani. So, so what I'm hearing is uh, the GGA, there, there will be maybe multiple functions of the GGA, for example, at the global level, it's really to showcase a global responsibility. And there will be a cascading, maybe uh, uh, cascading responsibilities going top down, but also bottom up in, in how to address adaptation priorities and needs. Um, and if I can ask again, uh, our, our panelists, how, how do you think that we can integrate local and most vulnerable voices in the adaptation frameworks that can be designed under the GGA? And that, I'll change it with the question, that can be you know, during the class, during our next two years process. But if you also have uh, examples and ideas on how the GGA can be made more inclusive within your own country and, and region, how the design uh, uh, of these adaptation frameworks can be made more inclusive, uh, please uh, go and address this point as well. And Pilar, I see you hand first, go ahead. Thank you, Emily. And um, with respect to, to this question on inclusivity, um, I, I think that when, when you read the submissions uh, prepared by, by the different countries and, and groupings, it's quite clear that there is a, a kind of consensus that we all agree that the process need to be inclusive and need to be participatory enough. But as you said, the issue is, is how, to, how to do this. Um, um, and and, and um, one, one step given, in, the, in order to do that, I think it's, it's this mixed approach in order to have two in-person events and two uh, virtual events. So that's uh, the first step. But then we need to recognize that um, the issue of inclusivity, it is about participation, but it's more than participation. It's also capacity building. Why, why I think is that that is the case? Because um, when you ask people, um, people that is not quite involved with the process because you need to be very involved with the process in order to understand all the discussions on the GGA, all the discussions on the GST, how, where, where this is coming as, as Funi uh, share before Paris, etc. You really need to be very involved. So the majority of actors and actresses are not quite involved with that. They don't know the story. So if you say, okay, you are in, even if you if you are invited to an event, so how that all that knowledge need to, how all that knowledge and ideas can be incorporated. So I really think that that we need to develop um, these two sides um, approach for from one side to build an agenda that allowed local actors, uh, regional actors, um, academy, um, um, youth. Um, um, traditional uh, actors and many others, local communities, to be part of, to, so to have specific panels in order to discuss the integration of all this progress and what is progress at each of these levels and spaces. So that's need to be done. 
but at, but at the same time, we need to prepare that. And in order to prepare that, we need to do a capacity building process. So uh, trying to work with the networks of cities, with the networks of uh, academy and, and research uh, actors and, and, and all the others. So we need to prepare that process. If we go directly to the SVs or we go directly to August or September workshops without preparing the field, I think that the problem will be will be the same. So um, I, I leave it here in order to avoid monopolizing the, the word, but, but um, well, we can come back or I can come back. Wonderful. Thank you, Pilar, for this. And I'll, I'll pass on to Moko in that, but we, also before passing, I'd like to encourage our panelists to say, you know, when we, when we say who we need to prepare for that and this needs to be done, who's actually, mm, who is the we and who is the the who needs to do what because it could be the global we is it the UNHCRC where are your expectations of uh where the actions need to to come from please Moko Inna, please the floor is yours and I, I think I <clears throat> thank you for, for for the next question I think I would I would uh, just support the point of uh, pillar that we actually need to um, um, do capacity building. Um, we, we have to capacitate uh, all levels uh, from grassroots up to maybe um, uh, um, um, decision makers. We, we have to be, we have to capacitate. I, I, I think uh, we have to um, use more of a bottom up approach where we collect this information uh, starting with the the uh, the grassroots, the local communities, and uh, uh, maybe we can also try to um, 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 explore if we can have discussion forums where uh, there's no one who is right. We we discuss issues um, based on uh, our different views, and we collect this information, make it a national um, 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 uh, um, national view until we get to the global. You, which I, I, I want to support what um, Fona has said that adaptation should of course be a, a global responsibility. But at, at the international level or at, at the global level, I, I think there should be um, 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 uh, different stakeholders, parties and non-party stakeholders should be given opportunity to, uh, to, to give their views. Uh, we are talking of vulnerable people, uh, indigenous people, they should be part of, of the process. Um, um, modalities of how to do that, uh, you might find that um, um, certain groups uh, work better uh, with certain modalities. So uh, I, I understand that there will be different modalities that would make it easy for different uh, groups to uh, uh, to work. Um, actually, in Lesotho, the booklet I have here is a national climate change policy. It was published in 2017, and it has seven, uh, 22 uh, policy statements. I just want to uh, read three of them. Uh, it's policy statement number um, number number. 16, 17, and 18, that says we have to promote participation of gender, youth, and vulnerable groups, uh, promote participation of civil society, and promote participation of uh, private sector. So we, we believe that uh, including all these um, um, uh, actors, we, we, we will do well with, I mean, in class. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mokraina. And uh, I cannot, I'm gonna go with Cindy next as uh, before and I would also encourage you uh, to give uh, examples of if there have been any initiatives that your country or your region have undertaken as part of the GD in the glass that I have included uh, that I've been part of the read that I've helped to include more local and vulnerable voices and the, the, the voices of different groups please do mention them as well because I think you know, talking about modalities and how this can be done is extremely important in making it happen. Cindy, please. Thank you very much. Um, 
I, I, I noticed how quickly time is going, so I, I don't want to repeat some of the things that uh, my colleague said before me. I want to concur with, um, with, with Pilar in her intervention, where she stated that it's not just about the logistics, uh, about participation. And I think there is, um, you know, support across the various submissions that the GLASS work program be convened, be transparent, inclusive, and include uh, many of the voices that we've listed, gender, vulnerable groups, local community groups, indigenous voices, and so on. And um, sure, but the, the, the question of how to um, have them participate and be included in the conversation, I think that's where some difficulty lie, lies. Um, and as far as small island developing states go, um, where you know, in terms of funding, bringing people to a, work, a physical workshop, um, generally there is some constraint there. And, you know, small island developing states rely on the secretariat and whatever funding they can um, access to uh, nominate and have delegates travel. And in many cases, you know, negotiators are, are prioritized as opposed to other actors and voices, which are very important, but then it becomes down, it comes down to how to allocate very limited resources. Um, but we've learned some lessons over the last few years and um, some of the events of the glass will be virtual. So hopefully we can leverage that and capitalize on it in order to have voices that may not be able to travel to Bonn um, to participate in discussions. And therefore, I think it's important um, how we prioritize and, and prepare for those workshops. Uh, uh, you know, the work that we do ahead of time becomes very important. And that's where I, I concur with Pilar that um, those of us who are very much involved in this, you know, we're in, we're immersed in it day to day. So it's easy for us to to you know speak to the issues, understand all the background, understand where how the discussion has evolved. But for other actors, whilst they are doing very important work, practical work on the ground, um, there is need for preparation in advance, and that includes capacity building. Um, and I'm saying that also because small island developing states, we well, there are different regions where we have small island states. And um, I would think that um, part of that approach uh, and part of that preparatory work can be done regionally. And it's important for regional institutions where they exist, where they have the power to uh, sort of shepherd parties and also bring in um, those other voices, experts, academia, um, community voices, indigenous voices to, um, you know, to assist or facilitate in some of that prep work. Uh, so for example, in the Caribbean region, we have the CARICOM Climate Change Center, which operates out of Belize, um, that coordinates um, uh, members of parties in the Caribbean um, to have discussions. And we have recently had meetings where um, other voices, other um, groups, NGOs and so on brought into the conversation. Very interesting because it's also an opportunity for negotiators and those who are formally in the process to learn about uh, other things that are being done in the region and you know, widen their views. On, on the topic. So I think that um, regional approaches and regional prep work could be very useful. And um, in the context of small island developing states where we have at least three regions, um, that would be very useful. And, and to concur with what Mokuina also said, um, that adaptation is, is so nuanced, different um, groups, different regions, even at an individual level, it's interpreted differently. So I think um, to agree with the speakers before me, uh, we need to do a lot before we get to, we get to those formal workshops. Thank you, Cindy. That's great. And, and you know, what it is, um, the, the, again, the importance of capacity building. Uh, and I'm before passing to, to Funanani, I'm going to throw the ideas. Should there be a, a more official capacity building work stream added to the glass in order to enable some of the regional approaches that, that Cindy has kind of given an example of? Um, Funanani, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Emily. And I would also not um, repeat what both uh, the three of my colleagues said, Pilar and Cindy and Mugwena have said. And I think I agree with, 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 what, with what they have um, raised. I think maybe as a 
let me just allow to allow me to highlight what we have done from the Africa region. Um, just after adopting the Glasgow, I think we unpacked the 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 work program with the experts that we have within the region, just so that we understand what is it that would be required uh, from us to make it uh, more successful, uh, implement it, uh, its implementation to be more, more successful. And I think that has really um, assisted Africa um, um, to prepare. And then um, nationally as a country, as South Africa, we have a something that we call a technical working group on adaptation, where it's comprised of um, NGOs, um, business, labor, and um, down from a grassroots level, uh, NGOs, where we then also have taken the glass to go there to unpack it so that they can also inform um, South Africa's um, submissions and the views that we will be taking forward into, into the work program. And I think those that's one example that I, I thought I should um, um, I should share that we have done as a country and also um, as a region. And I would have to agree that uh, indeed more conducive uh, uh, modalities would would be required to allow uh, various stakeholders um, to be able to to participate, even beyond the ones that have that have been mentioned in paragraph eleven um, of, of the work program. Um, and I think this can be done, maybe for example, to allow even a more uh, in person engagement. I don't know whether we will call it a capacity building and, and 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 so forth, because I would like to believe that beyond also the intergovernmental panel of climate change, there are also other role players internationally that can then um, uh, provide a valuable input for the for the work program. Um, thanks. Thank you. This is great. So we, we're hearing actually of quite a, a variety of potential ways that we can uh, from the, the, the participation, but not just participation, engagement and capacity building can be done through the glass. Uh, so you know that there could be as part of the glass, more capacity building, but also we've seen example uh, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, using uh, centers, uh, regional centers for discussion and exchanging views, uh, having climate change, national climate change strategies, uh, such as the one in Lesotho, having a, a technical working group, as such as in, in South Africa. And this all together, I think it, what I'm hearing is that really we need multiple strategies. There is not just one strategy. It seems quite obvious, but there needs to be multiple strategies at different levels that are the responsibilities of the, UNF, the UNFCCC, but also of countries themselves in, in leveraging the processes of the glass. Um, and please, dear panelists, if I'm putting words into your mouth, uh, do let me know and do correct me. Um, I now see, as you've mentioned, the time flies. And if there is another thing that we can take away from here is that uh, we need much more time to build capacities and to talk about these, these issues uh, because th this is how we're gonna advance understanding and action on adaptation. Um, so without further ado, uh, one of the questions of our audience is uh, so that, one of the concrete impacts of climate change is an increase in human displacements, particularly in vulnerable regions such as the SIDS. So how are countries from the panelists engaging with actors involved in migration under the glass? Uh, as may I add, as one of the voices and one of the issues that needs to be addressed in adaptation. So I can repeat. How are your countries or region, regions thinking about the, the voices and the, the, the issue of, of uh, people and actors involved in migration? Uh, how should that be taken? How is this taken into account under the glass? Or how do you think this should be taken uh, into account under the glass? Yes, Pilar. And I will, after that, I will volunteer Cindy as well, being from the SIDS. So just as a heads up. Thanks, Pilar. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, thank you, Emily. I was waiting for Cindy to start, um, but but I will break the the ice. Um, just just to say that um, this is a, a, a critical topic in all our regions. Uh, but sometimes politically, it's more raised by some regions than others. Um, 
the the numbers uh, in uh, current research and last studies with respect to, to migration related to climate change um, in our regions and many others is um, uh, something really overwhelming. Um, I think that um, this, this, this is one of the topics that need to be a cross-cutting consideration and it's not really uh, right now included in decision C, uh, 7 CMA 3 as, as something critical to take. So we don't have it in the objectives as, as one of the most important topics, but, but let me raise that um, um, some of the submissions included. And also uh, some submissions are very clear in terms of the opportunity to have different tracks on discussion. It's not only the workshops, but also the opportunity to have uh, technical discussions, uh, discussions about specific topics and specific levels of action. So I think that uh, along with this conversation of uh, specific opportunities for local actors, specific opportunities for, for transboundary uh, dimension and many others is, I, I think it's also uh, very important during the, the after, after the first workshop and, and between this part and, and COP27, the opportunity to have focused discussion on, on a topic such as uh, migration. And again, uh, to with the spirit of, um, being uh, equitable as possible in terms of, of geographical needs and approaches, because sometimes, as I said before, this is quite focusing one or two uh, regions or, or actors and actresses, and that could be unfair for a global process. So just that very general consideration from my part, but I'm sure that Cindy will enlighten us with, with more comments. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, um, Pilar. Um, whilst uh, whilst Pilar is talking, and, and even as you repeated the question, it, it is a very interesting question and a tough one at that, because it also um, makes, forces us to start to, to think about um, the, the limits to adaptation and uh, where inhabitants on islands, where they are impacted to that point where they can no longer continue to stay in their communities and they are have to consider moving elsewhere. Um, and therefore, I think um, in relation to the glass and in relation to adaptation generally and the GGA, we, we have to be cognizant of, of the limits. The limits are already being reached. The IPCC report reminded us about that. But to say all of that um, also in relation to the, to, to the glass and, and as included in many of the submissions, um, including the submissions from the Alliance of Small Island States, where we've asked for the uh, inclusion and um, active inclusion and engagement with um, expert bodies and international organizations um, for us to be able to have these discussions with them. So <clears throat> I think um, there would be value, and as, as Pilar said, um, not just the, the formal um, workshops under the glass, but um, other uh, focused discussions um, you know, over the next two years in relation to this topic. So I, I can't say exactly what um, maybe regions um, that comprise small island states might be doing already or what conversations they may be having, but certainly that is an opportunity for us to explore within the Glasgow uh, work, Shamal Sheikh work program. Uh, additional to that, I will, I will um, probably reiterate my point for regional discussions and approaches on this, um, because this is uh, also a humanitarian issue where uh, you know, communities, individuals, families have to relocate because they're being impacted. So it's um, it's it's yes, uh, it's at the global level we will we'll talk about it and so on. But at the very real level, in terms of administering assistance and assisting those who have to move, that takes place at a local level. So subnational governments, national governments, regional uh, institutions. Uh, and in many cases as well, it, it includes having actors such as um, bodies, churches, um, NGOs and so on, which render aid um, on a day-to-day -day basis um, and so forth. So I think the opportunity is there. We have to um, include this as a, a serious issue in the discussions under the glass. 
engage with our organizations, international organizations. Um, there are UN bodies working on displacement and migration issues al already. Um, engage, have these discussions, um, also not duplicate work where work is um, being done already, and leverage those spaces where conversations are happening because uh, the four workshops per year under the glass will go by very quickly and we have so many topics to discuss. So leverage other opportunities taking place in parallel uh, to meet these actors, have discussions and um, figure out um, what's the best way forward, what, what to put in place to enable those who are on the front lines to be able to survive because that's what it comes down to, um, people being able to survive and continue to live in safe spaces. Thank you, Cindy, for, for this. And I see uh, that we don't have much time. Uh, so I would encourage uh, you to please keep it uh, brief. Yeah, I will be very brief. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, I, I just wanted to um, uh, um, mention that the, the LDC group is a group of um, heterogeneous um, country, uh, countries where we have the, the seats being part of the LDC, the landlocked mountainous countries uh, being part of the, the group. So <clears throat> the, the issue of migration is, is a reality in the group. Um, we, I think Cindy has talked about the uh, migration happening in the uh, small islands. Uh, <clears throat> I, I also want to voice that even in other countries, there's a lot of migration happening. You see people moving from, from the rural areas into the cities uh, because poverty, um, food security has been a challenge due to extreme uh, climatic conditions. And um, you also see people crossing over to other countries. So too, we are like we have a big brother around us. We are, totally surrounded by South Africa. So whenever we, 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 we feel the heat of climate change and we, we, when we cross the, the border, we land in South Africa. So you see inter-country um, inter or cross-border movement due to impacts of climate change. I, I, I'm sure we have also heard that there's a lot of traffic in the Mediterranean Sea where a number of African are crossing, Africans are crossing over into the Europe uh, because of challenges we are, we are facing here. Um, this issue, I, I, I was just putting this um, uh, examples as to show how important this issue is, the issue of migration. The policy that I talked about, we have the, the last policy statement as to enhance social security or protection by managing climate-induced migration. So it's very important, thank you. Thank you so much, Mokraina. And I see we are at the hour. I would like to give our, our last panelist, Punanani, if you if you have any comment that you would like to add, uh, please do so before I will close on this amazing discussion. Yeah. Um. Thanks, Emily. And it's interesting. Was it was interesting to hear Lisa to mention in South Africa and typical example of transboundary issues there. But allow me to just answer two questions that I see on the on on the chats. Um, uh, one is uh, the work program about discussion events and workshop. Where is action? And I feel like. That is very important. For example, for South Africa, we did a submission uh, on the web program and we did highlight it that um, it, it is a challenge for us that our patient is still treated as not understood uh, uh, while there is information at an international level. Um, and also many African countries, all African countries, in fact, and many other developing countries have ranked adaptation as a priority. Hence now this work program for us should result in a very substantive action, um, including at COP27. That's very, very important for, for Africa, for South Africa. And I would also like to believe uh, for many other developing countries. Um, in terms of the second question, um, which I will try to just uh, uh, attempt to answer in a second. It's about the what what could be the the the, the gaps of bridging between local and global. I'll give you an example of when South Africa was doing the 
the, their own um, provincial uh, consultation on the national determined contribution. What we found with the, the, the grassroots level is the interpretation of the scientific knowledge, which has been a huge challenge for them to contribute. So I think those are some of the, the challenges that are there uh, 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 and that we should, at least from country, um, country levels try to explore how then we can bridge the gap. I gave an example of South Africa unpacking the, the, the work program um, into different actors in the countries that we have when we came back from, from Glasgow, which uh, seemingly uh, worked very well. Um, yeah, I'll stop right there, uh, Emily, in the noting that we are two minutes out of time. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think we could probably all stay here all afternoon uh, talking about this. And um, a, a, I'm very sad to have to close this discussion, but I'm actually very glad that even just within an hour, we have heard still some quite concrete uh, uh, suggestions and, and concrete examples of what has been done within regions and within countries to actually take actions and to, to leverage and to, to get voices together to be involved in the glass. I've heard from all the panelists that actually this is still not enough and there needs to be more support, more finance that can enable the capacity building and the integration of different groups of people within these regional processes and within these country and subnational processes. So bearing in mind some of the comments and the questions, I, I think that you know if we, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of similarity, I think, between what the panelists have, have shown in the importance of adaptation and the the challenge is how do we translate these into actions and focusing on who is this we, who is this us that is doing the actions related to the global responsibility that we all have to address and promote adaptation, uh, uh, you know, across the world. So I would uh, I would welcome our panelists and our attendees and our participants to keep on thinking about this. What are the actions that yourself, that maybe your country, that your region, uh, and that the UNFCCC internationally, other bodies should take, and to keep that in mind when uh, continuing to engage in the next class and GGA activities, either formal or not formal, because I think this is very uh, essential in making, in, in making an equitable and a fair uh, GGA and a fair glass process. On this very note, I thank everybody for um, for their participation and their engagement. Thanks to, to our lovely uh, four panelists. Thanks to the two presidencies supporting this process. Please note that this webinar will be available uh, as a recording within the next 48 hours. Please. Uh, we will be uh, publicizing it uh, through our IAD social media and it will be on our webpage. Uh, and we welcome, as usual, ongoing communications. Please do email us if you have comments and feedback, because this is the only way that we're going to be able to advance uh, and enhance adaptation action as much as possible. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a lovely day. <laughs>